In this video, we're going to look at how we regulate gene expression. So we need to be able to express the right genes in the right amount, in the right cell types, and at the right time so that we can maintain homeostasis. If we didn't produce the right genes at the right time, we would have a disease. So for example, we only want to make insulin when we have increased blood sugar. So after a meal, our blood sugar increases, and then we need the pancreas to make insulin to tell the cells to take up that glucose, and then the blood sugar will go down, and then we stay in homeostasis. The other thing is that only the pancreas cells make insulin. So every gene has to be expressed in a regulated way. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to look at a simple prokaryotic example of E. coli bacteria and how they regulate the transcription of genes that are related to the metabolism of lactose. So lactose is a type of sugar. It's a disaccharide. It is composed of a glucose and a galactose monosaccharide to make the disaccharide. So when bacteria consume lactose, they need to be able to break that into monosaccharides and they need to be able to use that for metabolism. So how bacteria can regulate the transcription of the genes involved in lactose metabolism is generally they can use activators and repressors. So an activator is something that is going to increase or turn on gene expression. And a repressor is something that is going to inhibit or prevent transcription so that those genes related to lactose metabolism are only transcribed when they're needed. So in bacteria, they have genes that are put together in what we call operons. So there's a few genes together that have one single promoter. So then when RNA polymerase binds to the promoter to transcribe those genes, all three of those genes will be transcribed. In our eukaryotic cells, we don't have operons. Every gene has its own promoter. Okay, so what we're going to do is we'll look at this simple example so we can see how regulation can work. In this diagram, we can see the LAC operon. So in bacteria, they have three genes that we call LACZ, LACY, and LACA, and LAC stands for lactose. So when the polymerase binds to the DNA, it will transcribe all three of these genes. There is a transcription start site or initiation site, and there is a transcription termination site so that the polymerase knows when to stop transcribing these genes. All three of these genes are involved in metabolizing lactose. Now over here on this left side of our transcription site, this is technically before the transcription site. We call that upstream. So upstream of the beginning of the gene is where we have regulatory DNA sequences. So this is the DNA, and there are regions on the DNA that are not genes, and they're not going to code for any protein. They are simply regulatory sequences where other proteins will bind so that they can have an effect. So there are three regulatory sequences that are important in this example. The cap binding site, which is where the cap binding protein will bind. So the binding site is the DNA regulatory sequence, and the binding protein is the protein. Then we have our promoter region. The promoter is a sequence of nucleotides where RNA polymerase will specifically bind. Over here, our last sequence in this example is called an operator sequence. This is a sequence on the DNA where the LAC repressor will bind. So remember, the repressor is going to prevent transcription from occurring. The cap binding or the activator is going to increase or promote transcription. And then we need our RNA polymerase to actually do the transcribing. When we look at this example, the bacterial cell is only going to transcribe those genes when there is lactose present. But there's a confounding factor because bacteria also like to eat glucose. So there are different things that are going to happen if glucose and lactose are both present. 
because the bacterium is going to prefer to use the glucose, it still will not transcribe the lac operon, even if lactose is present. In this first scenario, we will look at both glucose and lactose being present. When we have glucose, the bacterium is going to prefer to use glucose, which is a monosaccharide, and it doesn't need to be digested. It's immediately available for metabolism. So this is its preference. So when both of these are available, it's going to want to use glucose, which means that we are not going to activate this gene. The cap binding protein is only going to bind when there is no glucose. Then we have lactose is also present. So when lactose is present, lactose is going to impact the repressor. So when there is lactose, there is no repressor bound to the operator. Now, what about polymerase? Because polymerase normally binds to the promoter, it can only bind to the promoter to this promoter when the cap binding protein is bound, when the activator is there. So when there's no activator, there is no transcription. Example number two. Let's say we have no glucose present, but also no lactose. So when there is no glucose, what is happening with the cap binding site? Is cap going to bind? Cap activating proteins will bind when there is no glucose. What about when there is no lactose? What's going to happen with the repressor? Will the repressor bind to the operator or not? Yes, it will. When there is no lactose, the repressor will prevent transcription. So in this example, because the activator is present, polymerase can actually bind to the promoter. But because the repressor is present, there will not be transcription. In our third example, now we are going to have only glucose present. What's going to happen with our activators and repressors? If glucose is present, will the cap binding protein bind to the cap binding site? No, there will not be any binding because cap only binds when there is no glucose. If there is no cap, will the polymerase be able to bind? No, we need to have the activator there for the polymerase to bind to the promoter. There is no lactose. If there's no lactose, will the repressor bind to the operator or no? And it will. The repressor is going to bind to the operator and prevent transcription. So now in this scenario, we are missing the activator and we have the repressor. So no transcription is going to occur. Our last scenario, now only lactose is present. What's going to happen? There is no glucose. Will the cap binding protein bind? Will the activator bind to the cap binding site? When there is no glucose, yes. No glucose will stimulate the cap to bind to its regulatory sequence. When the cap binds, RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter. Now, lactose is present. So what's going to happen with the repressor? Will the repressor be bound or not? There will be no repressor because there is lactose present. So in this scenario, we have the activator, we've removed the repressor, and RNA polymerase has bound to the promoter. So this is the only situation when transcription will occur. And that makes sense because we only want to transcribe those genes when we need to or when the bacteria needs to. So the bacterium only needs to transcribe those genes when there is only lactose present. So that is the only scenario when those genes will be transcribed.
Now I want to go through a couple of scenarios with eukaryotic cells. So like us, human cells are eukaryotic and they're much more complex than bacteria. So all of our chromosomes are in every single cell. So we have 46 chromosomes inside of our cells. And our nucleus is only 10 micrometers in diameter. So our DNA has to be somewhat condensed, even when it's not going through cell division. So even when it's just normal growth one phase, doing normal cell things, some of the DNA is a little bit condensed. And this is called heterochromatin. When we have heterochromatin, those condensed areas are basically those genes in those condensed areas cannot be transcribed. This helps cells determine which genes they transcribe. So liver cells will have different areas of heterochromatin compared to red blood cells or bone cells. So heterochromatin helps our cells determine which genes that it has access to that it can transcribe. Number two, we have methylation. So a methyl group is a carbon with three hydrogens, and methyl groups can bind to certain nucleotides and silence transcription. This is important for developmental, different developmental stages. So we transcribe and translate different genes when we're an embryo, when we're a toddler, puberty, adults, and old age. So methylation helps to regulate gene transcription throughout our life stages. Number three, we have alternative splicing. Remember that in eukaryotic organisms, our gene sequences have different regions. We have introns and exons. The exons are the only portion of the gene that codes for the protein sequence. So the introns have to be removed during RNA processing. When we process genes, we can alternatively process so that different exons can end up in different messenger RNA molecules for transcription. And this is why we can make over 100,000 different proteins from only less than 25,000 different genes. Number four, messenger RNA degradation. Remember when we have RNA processing, if you forget, I'll put the link for the video below. RNA processing, we remove the introns. We also add a five prime cap and a three prime tail. The three prime tail is a bunch of adenines, right? Or poly A tail. The number of adenine nucleotides added to the three prime end determines the lifespan of the RNA molecule. If it has a long tail, that messenger RNA can go to multiple ribosomes to make multiple proteins. If it has a shorter tail, it will go to fewer ribosomes and make fewer proteins. So the length of the poly A tail determines the lifespan of the messenger RNA molecule, which results in differences in the amount of the protein that is produced. And then lastly, number five, we have transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins or groups of proteins or groups of molecules. They don't even have to be proteins. They could be steroid hormones, actually, also, for example. These molecules bind to specific regions on the DNA called enhancer elements. Here's a quick example. If we look at the human insulin gene, the insulin gene has a promoter region, which is where RNA polymerase is going to bind so that it can start transcription. But RNA polymerase can only bind if there are specific transcription factors. Transcription factors are basically activators. When we consume food, and our blood glucose level increases, the glucose will bind to chemoreceptors, receptors that recognize chemicals, in the pancreas. When the pancreas detects glucose, it is going to cause a signaling cascade of events that will lead to the release and binding of transcription factors to the enhancer sequence that is upstream of the gene. When these transcription factors have bound, RNA polymerase will find the promoter and then transcription can occur. In this way, 
the pancreas is only going to make insulin when it needs to. I want to point out that another thing that we can do that can stimulate transcription factors is thinking, which is really quite interesting. So let's think about something stressful. If you have a conflict with another person, that's usually a very stressful event. If you are anticipating a conflict or if something is going on and you aren't technically you know, arguing at the moment, but you are worrying about potential future arguments, you're going to trigger your stress response just as much, if not more so, than when you're actually confronted with the situation. So when we think, whether we're ruminating about something scary or uncomfortable or, um, or good, whatever we think about, we affect the transcription and translation of our genes. So in our stress response, when you worry, you are triggering your hypothalamus, your pituitary gland, your adrenal glands, and your autonomic nervous system to regulate the expression of all kinds of genes. For example, epinephrine, which is a hormone or a neurotransmitter that will dilate blood vessels, increase heart rate, dilate your bronchial tubes, increase blood flow to your muscles. A cortisol, when you increase cortisol from worrying, it is going to have all of the cortisol effects like inhibiting your immune system and increasing storage of belly fat and removing minerals from your bones. There are lots of things that can happen in our body purely from thought. And this is why on the opposite side of our stress response is meditation is a very healthy practice for a lot of people because it helps to reduce those stress hormones. And stress hormones, when you're not having an actual stress, can be very detrimental to our body. So when we meditate and we calm our brain, calm our thinking, we affect transcription and translation. And here's a summary chart of the eukaryotic methods for regulating gene expression.